Welcome back. Today is uh, episode two. Oswald Spangler, The Clan of the West, reading one hour at a time. I'm in the introduction. Part eight. Today we think in continents, and it is only our philosophers and historians who have not realized that we do so. Of what significance to us, then, the conceptions or conceptions and purviews that they put before us as universally valid, when in truth their further, furthest horizon does not extend beyond the intellectual atmosphere of Western man. Examine from this point of view our best books. When Plato speaks of humanity, he means the Hellens, the Greeks, in contrast to the barbarians, which is entirely constant, consonant with the ahistoric mode of the classical life and thought and his premises take him to conclusions that for Greeks were complete and significant. When, however, Kant philosophizes, say, on ethical ideas, he maintains the validity of his theses of, for, for men at, of all times and places. He does not say this in so many words for, for himself and his readers. It is something that goes without, without saying. In his aesthetics, he formulates the principles, not of Phidias' art or Rembrandt's art, but of art generally. But when he poses, a poses, a when he poses as necessary forms of thought are in reality only necessary forms of Western thought. Though, though a glance at Aristotle and his essentially different conclusions should have sufficed to show that Aristotle's uh, should have shown to show that Aristotle's intellect, not less penetrating than his own, was of different structure from it. The categories of the Westerner are just as alien to Russian thought as they are to ch a Chinaman or the Greek are to him. For us, the effective and complete comprehension of classical root words is just as impossible as the Russian and Indian, as that of the Russian and Indian, and for the modern Chinese or Arab, with their utterly different intellectual constitutions. Philosophy from Bacon to Kant has only a curiosity value. It is this that is lacking in the Western thinker, the very thinker in whom we might have expected to find it, insight into the historically relative character of his data, which are expressions of one specific existence and one only, knowledge of the necessary limits of their validity. The conviction that his unshakable truths and eternal views are simply true for him and eternal for his worldview, the duty of looking beyond them to find out what men of other cultures have with equal certainty evolved out of themselves. That and nothing else will impart completeness to the philosophy of the future, and only through an understanding of the living world shall we understand the symbolism of history. Here there is nothing constant, nothing universal. We must cease to speak of the terms of the forms of thought, the, ph the principles of tragedy, the mission of the state. Universal validity involves always the fallacy of arguing from a particular to particular. But something much more disquieting than a logical fallacy begins to appear when the center of gravity of philosophy shifts from the abstract systemic into the practical, ethical, and our Western thinkers from Schopenhauer onward. Uh, turn from the problem of cognition to the problem of life, the will to life, to power, to action. Here it is not the ideal abstract man of Kant that is subjected to examination, that is subjected to examination, but actual man as he has inhabited the earth during historical time, grouped, whether primitive or advanced, by peoples. And it is more than ever futile to define the structure of the highest of his highest ideas in terms of the ancient medieval modern scheme with its local limitations. But it is done nevertheless. Consider the historical horizon of Nietzsche. His conceptions of decadence, militarism, and transvaluation of all values, the will to power, lie deep in the essence of Western civilization, and are for the analysis of, this, of that civilization of decisive importance. But what, do we find, was the foundation on which he built his built up his creation. Romans and Greeks, Renaissance and European present, with a fleeting and uncomprehending side glance at Indian philosophy, in short, ancient, medieval, and modern history. Strictly speaking, he never once moved outside the scheme, nor 
nor did any other thinker of his time. What correlation, then, is there, or can there be, of his idea of the Dionys Dionysian uh, with the inner life of a highly civilized Chinese or an up-to-date American? What is the significance of this type of Superman for the world of Islam? Can image-forming antithes antitheses of nature and intellect, heathen and Christian, classical and modern, have any meaning for the soul of the Indian or the Russian? What can Tolstoy, who from the depths of his humanity rejected the whole Western world idea as something alien and distant, do with the Middle Ages, with Dante, with Luther? What can a Japanese do with Parzival and Zarathustra, or an Indian with Sophocles? And it's the thought reigns of Schopenhauer, Kant, Feuerbach, Hebel, or Strindberg any weirder, any wider? Is not their whole psychology, for all its intention of worldwide validity, one of purely Western European significance? How comic seems Ibsen's women problems, which also challenge the attention of all humanity, when, for his famous Nora, the Lady of the North, West European city, with the horizon that is implied by a house rent of 100 pounds to 300 pounds a year, and a Protestant upbringing, we substitute Caesar's wife, Madame de Sevigne, Sevigne, a Japanese or Turkish peasant woman. But for that matter, Ibsen's own circle of vision is that of the middle class in a great city of yesterday to today. His conflicts, which start from spiritual premises that did not exist till about 1850, can scarcely last beyond 1950, and neither of those great world, neither of the great world nor those of the lower masses, still less those of the cities inhabited by non-European populations. All these are local and temporary values, most of them indeed limited to the momentary intelligentsia of cities of Western European, of the Western European type. World historical or eternal values, they empathetically are not. Whether the substantial importance of Ibsen's and Nietzsche's generation may be, it infringes the very meaning of the word, world history, which denotes the totality and not a selected part, to subordinate, to undervalue, or to ignore the factors which lie outside modern interests. Yet, in fact, they are so undervalued or ignored to an amazing extent. What the West has said and thought hitherto on the problems of space, time, motion, number, will, marriage, property, tragedy, science, has remained narrow and dubious, because men were always looking for the solution to the question. It was never seen that many questioners implies many answers, that any philosophical question is really a veiled desire to get an explicit affirmation of what is implicit in the question itself, that the great questions of any period are fluid beyond all conception, and therefore it is only by obtaining a group of historically limited solutions and measuring it by utterly impersonal criteria that the final secrets can be reached. The real student of mankind treats no standpoint as absolutely right or absolutely wrong. In the face of such grave problems as that of, the of, that of time or that of marriage, it is insufficient to appeal to personal experience or an inner voice or reason or the opinion of ancestors or contemporaries. These may say what is true for the questioner himself and for his time, but that is not all. In other cultures, the phenomenon talks a different language. For other men, there are different truths. The thinker must admit the validity of all, or of none. How greatly, then, Western world criticism can be widened and deepened. How immensely far beyond the innocent relativism of Nietzsche and his generation one must look. How fine one's sense for form and one's psychological insight must become. How completely one must free oneself from limitations of self, of practical interests, of horizon, before one dare assert the pretension to understand world history, the world as history. Nine. In opposition to all these arbitrary and narrow schemes, derived from tradition or personal choice, into which history is forced, I put forward the natural, the Copernican, 
form from the historical process which lies deep in the essence of that process and reveals itself only to an eye perfectly free from pre prepossessions. Such an eye was Goth's. That which Goth called living nature is exactly that which we are calling here world history, world as history. Goeth, who, has, who as artist portrayed the life and development, always the life and development of his figures, of the thing becoming and not the thing become, Wilhelm Meister and Wahrheit und Dichtung hated mathematics. For him, the world as mechanism stood opposed to the world as organism, dead nature to living nature, law to form. As naturalist, every line he wrote was meant to display the image of the thing becoming, the impressed form, living and developing, si living and developing, sympathy, observation, comparison, immediate and inward certainty, intellectual flair. These were the means whereby he was enabled to approach the secrets of the phenomenal world in motion. Now those are the moans, are the means of historical research, precisely these and no others. It was this godlike insight that prompted him to say at the bivouac fire on the evening of the Battle of Valmy. Here and now begins a new epoch of world history, and you gentlemen can say that you were here, you were there. No general, no diplomat, let alone the philosophers, ever so directly felt history becoming. It is the deepest judgment that any man ever uttered about a great historical act in the moment of, of its accomplishment. And just as he followed out the development of the plant form from the leaf, the birth of the vertebrate type, the process of the geological strata, the destiny in nature and not the causality. So here we shall develop the, for, the form language of human history, its periodic structure, its organic logic out of the profusion of all the challenging details. In other aspects, mankind is habitually and rightly reckoned as one of the organisms of the Earth's surface, its physical structure, its natural functions, the whole phenomenal conception of it all belong to a more comprehensive unity. Only in this aspect is it treated otherwise, despite the deeply felt relationship of plant destiny and human destiny, which is an eternal theme of all lyrical poetry. And despite the similarity of human history to that of any other of the higher life groups, which is, to refrain, is the refrain of endless beast legends, sagas, and fables. But only bring analogy to bear on this aspect, as on the rest, letting the world of human cultures intimately and unreservedly work upon the imagination instead of forcing it into the into a ready-made scheme. Let the words youth, growth, maturity, decay, hitherto and today more than ever, used to express subjective valuations and entirely personal preferences in sociology, ethics, and aesthetics be taken at last as objective descriptions of organic states, set forth the classical culture as a self-contained phenomenon, embodying and expressing the classical soul. Put it beside the Egyptian, the Indian, the Babylonian, the Chinese, and the Western, and determine for each of these the higher individuals, higher individuals what is typical in their surgings and what is necessary in their riot of incident and then at last will unfold itself the picture of world history that is natural to us men of the west and to us alone ten our narrow task then is primarily to determine from such a world survey the state of west europe and america as the epoch of 1800 to 2000 to establish the chronological position of this period in the ensemble of Western culture history, its significance as a chapter that is in one or other guise, necessarily found in the biography of every culture, and the organic and symbolic meaning of its political, artistic, intellectual, and social expression forms. Considered in the spirit of analogy, this period appears as chronologically parallel, contemporary in our special sense. 
with the phrase of Hellenism and its present culmination, marked by the World War, corresponds with the transition from the Hellenistic to the Roman Age. Rome, with its rigorous realism, uninspired, barbaric, disciplined, practical, Protestant, Prussian, will always give us, working as we must by, by analogies, the key to understanding our own future. The break of destiny that we express by hyphening the words Greek Romans is occurring for us also, separating that which is already fulfilled from that which is to come. Long ago, we might, we might and should have seen in the classical world a development which is the complete counterpart of our Western development. Differing indeed from it in every detail of the surface, but entirely similar as regards the inward power driving the greater organism towards its end. We might have found the constant alter ego of our own actuality in establishing the correspondence, item by item, from the Trojan War and the Crusades, Homer and the Nibelunglied, through Doric and Gothic, Dionysian movement, and Renaissance. Polycletus and John Sebastian Bach, Ath Athens and Paris, Aristotle and Kant, Alexander and Napoleon, to the world city and the, imp and the imperialism common in both cultures. Unfortunately, this requires interpretation of the picture of classical history, very different from the incredibly one-sided, superficial, prejudiced, limited picture that we have, in fact, given it to it. We have, in truth, been only too conscious of our near relation to the classical age, and only too prone in consequence to unconsidered assertion of it. Superficial similarity is a great snare, and our classical study fell a victim to it as soon as it passed from the admittedly masterly, ordering and critique of the discoveries of the interpretation of their spiritual meaning. That close inward relation in which we conceive ourselves to stand towards the classical, and which leads us to think that we are its pupils and successors, whereas in reality we're simply adorers, is a venerable prejudice which ought to, which ought at last to be put aside. The whole religious, philosophical, art, historical, and social critical work of the nineteenth century has been necessary to enable us not to understand. Iscleus. Plato, Apollo, Dionysus, and Ath the Athenian state, and Caesarism, which we are far indeed from doing, but to begin to realize once and for all how immeasurably alien and distant these things are from our inner selves, more alien maybe than Mexican gods and Indian architecture. Our views of the Greco-Roman culture have always swung between these two extremes, and our standpoints have invariably been defined for us by the ancient medieval modern scheme. One group, public men before all the before all else, economists, politicians, jurists, opine that the present day mankind is making excellent progress, assess it and its performances at the very highest value, and measure everything early earlier by its standards. There is no modern party that has not weighed upon Cleon, Marius, Themistocles, Catiline, the Gracchi, according to its own principles. On the other hand, we have, we have the group of artists, poets, philologists, and philosophers. These feel themselves to be out of their element in the aforesaid present, and in, correspond, in consequence, choose for themselves in this or that past epoch a standpoint that is in its, own, in its way just as absolute and dogmatic from which to condemn today. The one group looks upon Greece as a not yet, the other upon, moder upon modernity as a nevermore. Both labor under the obsession of a scheme of history which treats the two epochs as part of the same straight line. Hey, Mike. In this opposition, it is the two souls of Faust that express themselves. The danger of one group lies in a clever superficiality. In its hands there remains, finally, of all classical cultures, of all reflections of the classical soul, 
nothing but a bundle of social, economic, political, and physiological facts, and the rest is treated as secondary results, reflexes, attendant phenomena. In the books of this group, we find not a hint of the mythical force by Cicleus Chorus, of the immense Mother Earth struggle of the Earth sculpture, the Doric Column, of the richness of the Apollo cult, of the real depth of the Roman Emperor worship. The other group, composed above all of belated Roman Romanticists, represented in recent times by the three Basil professors, Bachoffen, Burkhardt, and Nietzsche, succumb to the usual dangers of ideology. They lose themselves in the clouds of an antiquity that is really no more than the image of their own sensibility in a physiological mirror. They rest their case upon the only evidence which they consider worthy to support it, vis-a-vis -vis the relics of the old literature. Yet there never was a culture so incompletely represented for us by its great writers. The first group, on the other hand, supports itself principally upon the humdrum material of law sources, inscriptions, and coins, which Burkhart and Nietzsche very much on their own loss despised, to their own loss despised, and subordinates thereto, often with little or no sense of truth, in fact, the surviving literature. Consequently, even in the point of critical foundations, neither group takes the other seriously. I have never heard that Nietzsche and Mommsen had the smallest respect for each other. But neither group has attained to that higher method of treatment, which reduces the opposition, this opposition of criteria to ashes, although it was within their power to do so. In their self-limitation, they paid the penalty for taking over the causality principle from natural science. Unconsciously, they arrived at a pragmatism that sketchily copied the world picture drawn by physics, and instead of revealing, obscured and confused, the quite other natural for nature for other natured forms of history. They had no better expedient for subjecting the mass of historical material to critical and normative examination than to consider one complex of phenomenon Uh, phenomena as being primary and causative, and the rest as being secondary, as being consequences or effects. And it was not only the matter of fact school and the that resorted. It's not only the matter of fact school that resorted to this method. The Romanticists did likewise, for history had not revealed even to their dreaming gaze its specific logic, and yet they felt that there was an imminent necessity to it in it to determine that that. The, this somehow, rather than turn their backs upon history in despair like Schopenhauer. 11. Briefly, then, there are two ways of regarding the classical, the materialistic and the ideological. By the former, it is asserted that the sinking of one scale pan has its cause in the rising of the other, and it is shown that this occurs invariably, truly a striking theorem. And in this juxtaposing of cause and effect, we naturally find the social and sexual, at all events in purely political, facts class as causes and the religious, intellectual, and so far as the materialist tolerates them as facts as all, as facts at all, the artistic as effects. On the other hand, the ideologues show that the rising of one scale pan follows from the sinking of the other, which they are able to prove, of course, with their equal exactitude. This done, they lose themselves in the cults, mysteries, customs, to the secrets of the st strophe and the line, throwing scarcely a side glance at the commonplace daily life. For them, an unpleasant consequences, consequence of earthly imperfection. Each cannot or will not understand the true linkages of things, and each ends by calling the other blind, superficial, stupid, absurd, or frivolous, oddities or philistines, it shocks the ideologue if anyone deals with the Hellenic finance problems in it, and instead of, for example, telling us the deep meanings of the Delphic Oracle, describes the far-reaching money operations which the Oracle priests undertook with their accumulated treasures. The politician, on the other hand, has a superior smile for those who waste their enthusiasm on ritual formulae and the dress of the Attic youths. Instead of writing a book adorned with up-to-date catchwords and antique class struggles, the one type is foreshadowed 
from the very outset in Petrarch. It created Florence and Weimar in the Western and the Western classicism. The other type appears in the middle of the 18th century, along with the rise of civilized economic mega, megalopolitan politics, and England is therefore its birthplace, Grote. At bottom, the opposition is between the conceptions of culture man and those of civilization man, and it is too deep, too essentially human, to allow the weaknesses of both standpoints alike to be seen or overcome. The materialist himself is on that is on this point an idealist. He too, without wishing or desiring it, has made his views dependent upon his wishes. In fact, all our finest minds, without exception, have bowed down reverently before the picture of the classical, abdicating this abdication abdicating in this one instance alone their function of unrestricted criticism. The freedom and power of classical research are always hindered, and as data obscured by a certain almost religious awe. In all history, there is no an there is no analogous case for one culture making a passionate cult of the memory of another. Our devotion is evidenced yet again by the fact that since the Renaissance, a thousand years of history have been undervalued so that an ideal middle age may serve as a link between ourselves and antiquity. We Westerners have sacrificed on the classical altar the purity and independence of our art, for we have not dared to create without a side glance to the sublime exemplar. We have projected our own deepest spiritual needs and feelings on the classical picture. Some day a gifted psychologist will deal with this most fateful illusion and tell us the story of the classical that we have so consistently reverenced since the days of Gothic. Few theses would be more helpful for the understanding of Western soul, the Western soul from Otto the Third, the first victim of the South, to Nietzsche the last. Goethe, in his Italian tour, in his Italian tour, speaks with enthusiasm of the buildings of Palladio, whose frigid and academic work we today regard very skeptically. But when he goes on to Pompeii, he does not conceal his dissatisfaction in experiencing a strange, un half unpleasant impression. And what he has to say on the, the temples of Pistrum and Segesta, masterpieces of Hellenic art, is embarrassed and trivial, palpably when classical antiquity in its full force met him face to face, he did not recognize it. It is the same with is the same with all others. Much that was classical they chose not to see, and so they saved their inward image of the classical, which was in reality the background of a life ideal that they themselves had created and nourished with their heart's blood, a vessel filled with their own world feeling, a phantom, an idol, the audacious descriptions of Arist Aristophanes, Juvenal, or Petronius, of life in the classical cities, the southern dirt and riffraff, terrors and brutalities, pleasure boys and fearnies, phallus worship and imperial orgies, excite the enthusiasm of the student and the dil dilettante, who find the same realities in the world cities of today, too lamentable and repulsive to face. In the city's life is bad, there are too many of the lustful. Also, Sprach, Zarathustra. They command the state sense of the Romans, but despise the, the man of today who permits himself any contact with public affairs. There is a type of scholar whose clarity of vision comes under some irresistible, irresistible spell when it turns from a frock coat to a toga, from a British football ground to a Byzantine circus, from a transcontinental railway to the Roman road in the Alps, from a 30-knot destroyer to a trim, trireme, from Prussian bayonets to Roman spears, nowadays even from a modern engineer's Suez Canal to that of a pharaoh. He would admit to a steam engine he would admit to a steam engine as a symbol of 
human passion and expression of intellectual force if it were hero of Alexandria who invents it, not otherwise. To such it seems blasphemous to talk of Romans central heating or bookkeeping in preference to the worship of the great mother of the gods. But the other school sees nothing but these things. It thinks it exhausts the essence of this culture. Alien as it is to ours, by treating the Greeks as simply equivalent, and it obtains its conclusions by means of the simple factual substitutions, ignoring altogether the classical soul. That there is not the slightest inward correlation between the things meant by a republic, freedom, property, and the like, then and there, and the things meant by such words here and now, it has no notion whatever. It makes fun of the historians of the age of Goeth, who, const who honestly express their own political ideas in classical history, uh, classical history forms, and reveal their own personal enthusiasms in, in, in vindications or condemnations of lay figures named Lycurgus, Brutus, Cato, Cicero, Augustus. But, it's, but it cannot itself write a chapter without reflecting the party opinion of its morning paper. It is, however, much the same whether the past is treated in the spirit of Don Quixote or that of Sancho Panza. Neither way leads to the end. In sum, each school permits itself to bring into high relief that part of the classical work which best expresses its own views. Nietzsche and pre-Socratic Athens, the economists of the Hellenistic period, the politicians, uh, Republican Rome, poets, and the Imperial Age. Not that religious and artistic phenomena are more primitive than social and economic, any more than the reverse. For the man who in these things has won his unconditional freedom of, the, of outlook beyond all personal interests whatso whatsoever, there is no dependence, no priority, no relation of cause and effect, no differentiation of value or importance. That which assigns relative ranks amongst the individual detailed facts is simply the greater or less purity and force of their form language, their symbolism, beyond all questions of good and evil, high and low, useful and ideal. 12. Looked at in this way, the decline of the West comprises nothing less than the problems of civilization. We have before us one of the fundamental questions of all higher history. What is civilization, understood as the organic logical sequel, fulfillment, and finale of a culture? For every culture has its own civilization. In this work, for the first time, in the two words hitherto in ex used to express an indefinite, more or less ethical distinction, are used in a periodic sense to express a strict and necessary organic succession. Civilization is the inevitable destiny of the culture. And in this principle, we obtain the viewpoint from which the deepest and gravest problems of historical morphology become capable of solution. Civilizations are the most external and artificial states of which a species of developed humanity is capable. They are a conclusion. The thing become, succeeding the thing becoming, death following life, rigidity following expansion, intellectual age and the stone-built, petrifying world city following the Mother Earth, and the spiritual childhood of the Doric and Gothic. They are an end, irrevocable, irrevocable, yet by inward necessity reached again and again. So for the first time, we are enabled to understand the Romans as the successors of the Greeks, and the light is projected in the deepest forms of the late classical period. But this... What but this can be the meaning of the fact, which can only be disputed by vain phrases, that the Romans were barbarians who did not precede but close the great development, unspiritual, unphilosophical, devoid of art, clannish to the point of brutality, aiming relentlessly at tangible successes, they stand between the Hellenistic culture and nothingness. An imagination directed purely to practical objects, 
they had religious laws governing Godward. Where am I? They had religious laws governing Godward relations as they had other laws governing human relations, but there was no specifically Roman saga of gods, which was something not found at all in, in Athens. In a word, Greek, soul, Roman intellect, in this antithesis of the differentia between culture and civilization. Nor is it only the classical that to the classical that it applies. Again and again, there appears this type of strong-minded, completely non-metaphysical man, and in the hands of this type lies the intellectual and material destiny of each in every late period. Such are the men who carried through the Babylonian, the Egyptian, the Indian, the Chinese, and the Roman civilization. And in such periods, do Buddhism, Stoicism, Socialism ripen into definitive world conceptions, which enable a moribund humanity to be attacked and reformed in its intimate structure. Pure civilization as a historical process consists in a progressive taking down of forms that have become inorganic or dead. The transition from culture to civilization was accomplished for the classical world in the fourth uh, and f uh, for the Western in this 19th century. From these periods onward, the great intellectual decisions take place, not as in the days of the Orpheus, Orpheus movement or the Reformation in the wor whole world, where not a hamlet is too small to be unimportant, but in three or four world cities that have absorbed into themselves the whole content of history, while the old wide landscape of the culture become more provincial serves only to feed the cities with what remains of its higher mankind. World, city, and province, the two basic idea of it, ideas of every civilization, bring up a wholly new problem for history, the very problem that we are living through today with hardly the remotest conception of its immensity. In place of a world, there is a city, a point, in which the whole life of broad regions is collecting while the rest dries up. In place of this type true people, born of and grown by the soil, there is a new sort of nomad, cohering unstably in fluid masses, the parasitical silly dweller, traditionless, utterly matter of fact, religionless, clever, unfruitful, deeply contemptuous of the countryman, and especially that highest forms of a countryman, the country gentleman. This is a very great stride towards the inorganic, towards the end. What does it signify? France and England have already taken the step. Germany is beginning to do so. And Germany is beginning to do so. After Syracuse, Athens, and Alexandria comes Rome. After Madrid, Paris, London, come Berlin and New York. It is the destiny of whole regions that lie outside the radiation circle of these cities. Of old Crete, and Macedon, and today the Scandinavian North, to become provinces. Of old, the field on which the oppressed conception, the opposed conception of an epoch came to battle, was some world problem of a metaphysical, religious, or dogmatic kind. And the battle was between the soil genius of the countryman, noble priest, and the worldly patrician genius of the famous old small towns of Doric or Goth, Gothic springtime. Of such a character were the conflicts over the Dionysus religion, as in the tyranny of Cleisthen Cleisthenes uh, of Sicyon, and those of the reformation of the German free cities and the Huguenot wars. But just as these cities overcame the countryside, already it is purely a civic war. It is a purely civic world outlook that appears in even Para Parmenides and Descartes. So in turn, the world city overcame them. It is the common intellectual process of latter periods, such as the Ionic and the Baroque, that today, as 
in the Hellenistic Age, which at its outset saw foundations of artificial land alien Alexandria, culture cities like Florence, Nuremberg, Salonika, Bruges, and Prague, that become provincial towns and fight inwardly a lost battle against the world cities. The world city means cosmopolitanism in place of home, cold matter of fact in place of reverence for tradition and age, scientific irreligion of a, as a fossil representative of the older religion of the heart, society in place of the state, natural instead of hard-earned rights. It was in the, it was in the conception of money as an organic, inorganic and abstract magnitude, entirely disconnected from the motion the notion of the fruitful earth and the primitive values that the Romans had the advantage over the Greeks. Thenceforward, any high ideal of life becomes largely a question of money. Unlike the Greek Stoicism of Chrysippus, the Roman Stoicism of Cato and Seneca presupposes a private income, and unlike that of the 18th century, the social ethical sentiment of the 10th, 20th, if it is to be realized at a higher level, than that of professional and lucrative agitation is a matter for millionaires. To the world city belongs not a folk but a mass. Its con uncomprehending hostility to all the traditions representative of the culture, nobility, church, privileges, dynasties, convention, and art, and limits of knowledge and science, the keen and cold intelligence that confounds the wisdom of the present, the new fashioned naturalism that in relation to all matters of sex and society go back far beyond Rousseau and Socrates to quite primitive instincts and conditions. Then the reappearance of the Panem et Circensis in the form of wages, wage disputes and football grounds all these things betoken the definite closing down of the culture and the opening of quite a new phase of human existence, anti-provincial, late, futureless, but quite inevitable. This is what has to be viewed, and viewed not with the eyes of the part, partisan, the ideologue, the up-to-date novelist, not from that of the standpoint, but in a high, time-free perspective, embracing whole millenniums of historical world forms. If we are really to comprehend the great crisis of the present, To me, it is a symbol of the first importance that in the Rome of Crassus, Trimver, and all-powerful building site speculator, or Triumvir and all-powerful building site speculator, the Roman people, with its proud inscriptions, the people before whom Gauls, Greeks, Parthians, Syrians, afar trembled, lived in appalling misery in the many-storied lodging houses of dark suburbs, accepting with indifference or even with a sort of sporting interest the consequences of the military expansion, that many famous old noble families, descendants of the men who defeated the Celts and the Samnites, lost their ancestral homes through standing apart from the wild rush of speculation and were reduced to renting wretched apartments, that while along the Apian Way, Appian Way, there rose splendid and still wonderful tombs of the financial magnates. The corpses of the people were thrown along with the animal carcasses and ta the town's <clears throat> and town refuse into a monstrous common grave. Till in Augustus's time, it was banked over for the avoidance of pestilence, and so it became the site of Machinus' renowned park that in depopulated Athens, which lived on visitors and on the bounty of rich foreigners, the mob of parvenu tourists from Rome gaped at the works of the Percle Perclean Age, with as little understanding as the American globetrotter in the Sistine Chapel at those of Michelangelo. 
every removable art piece having here this been taken away or bought at fancy prices to be replaced by the Roman buildings which grew up colossal and arrogant by the side of the low and modest structures of the old time. In such things, which is it is the historian's business not to praise or to blame, but to consider the morphologically, there lies plain and immediate, immediate enough for one who has learnt to see an idea. For it will become manifest that from that moment on, all great conflicts of the world outlook, of politics, of art, of science, of feeling, will be under the influence of this one opposition. What is the hallmark of a polite civilization today, in contrast to the politics of yesterday? It is for the classical rhetoric and for the Western journalism, both serving the abstract, which represents the power of civilization. Money. It is the money spirit which penetrates unremarked that historical forms of the people's existence often without destroying or even in the least disturbing or even in the least disturbing these forms the form of the Roman state for instance the, the form of the Roman states for the form of the Roman state for instance underwent very much less alteration between the great political parties uh, between the elder Scipio and Augustus than is usually imagined. Though forms subsist, the great political parties nevertheless cease to be more than reputed centers of decision. The decision, in fact, lies elsewhere. A small number of superior heads, whose names are likely not, known, not the best known, settle everything while well, below them are the great mass of second-rate politicians, rhetors, tribunes, deputies, journalists, selected through a provincially conceived franchise to keep alive the illusion of popular self-determination. In art, philosophy, the ideas of the Platonic or those of the Kantian age had for the higher mankind concerned a general, a general validity, but those of the Hellenistic age or those of our own are valid exclusively in the brain of the megapol megalopolitan, for the villagers, or generally, the nature man's world feeling of our socialism, like its near relation Darwinism, how utterly ungothian are the formulae of struggle for existence and natural selection, like its other relative, the woman and marriage problem of Ibsen, Strindberg, and Shaw, like the impressionistic tendencies of our anarchic sensuousness and the whole bundle of modern longings. Temptations and pains expressed in Baudelaire, Baudelaire's verse and Wagner's music are simply non-existent. The small town, the more unmeaning it becomes. The smaller the town, the more unmeaning it becomes to busy oneself with painting or with the music of these kinds. To the culture, to the culture belong gymnastics, the tournament, the Aegon, and to the civilization belong sport. This is the true distinction between the Hellenic, Hellenic palaestra and the Roman circus. Art itself becomes a sport, hence the phrase art for art's sake, to be played before a highly intelligent audience of connoisseurs and buyers, whether the feat consists in mastering absurd instrumental tone masses and taking harmonic fences, or in some tour de force of coloring. Then a new fact philosophy appears which can only spare a smile for the metaphysical speculation. In a new literature, that is a necessity for life for the meg megalopolitan palate and nerves and both unintelligible and ugly to the provincials. Neither Alexandrine poetry nor plein d'air painting is anything to the people. And then, as now, the phrase of transition. Uh, the phase of transition is marked by a series of scandals only to be found at such moments. The anger evoked in the Athenian populace by Euph Euripides and by the revolutionary painting of Apollodorus, for example, is repeated in the opposition to Wagner, Manet, Ibsen, and Nietzsche. It is possible to understand the Greeks without mentioning their economic relations. 
The Romans, on the other hand, can only be understood through these. Caronia Carinori- and Leipzig were the last battles fought about an idea. In the First Punic War and in 1870, economic motives are no longer overlooked. Not till the Romans came with their practical energy was slaveholding given the big collective character which many studies, many students regard as the die stamp of classical economics, legislation, and a way of life, and which in any event vastly lowered both the value and inner worthiness of such free labor as continued to exist side by side with gang labor. And it was not the Latin, but the Germanic peoples of the West and America who developed out of the steam engine, a big industry that transformed the face of the land. The relation of these phenomena to Stoicism and Socialism is unmistakable. Not till the Roman Caesarism, foreshadowed by C. Flaminius, shaped first by Marius, handled by strong-minded large-scale men of fact, did the classical world learn preeminence of money. Without this fact, neither Caesar nor Rome generally is understandable. In every Greek, it's a Don Quixote. In every Roman, the Sancho Panza factor. And these factors are dominance. Thirteen. Considered in itself, the Roman world dominion was a negative phenomenon, being the result of a surplus of energy on one side that the Romans had never had since Sama, but a deficiency of resistance on the other. That the Romans did not conquer the world is certain. They merely took possession of a booty, that lay open to everyone. The Imperium Romanum came into existence not as the result of such an extremity of military and financial effort as it characterized the Punic Wars because the Old East forewent all external self-determinations. We must not be deluded by the appearance of brilliant military successes. With a few trained, ill-led and sullen legions Lucullus and Pompey conquered whole realms, a phenomenon that in this period, in the period of the Battle of Ipsus, would have been unthinkable. The Mithridatic danger, serious enough for a system of material force, which had never been put to any real test, would have been nothing to the conquerors of Hannibal. After Zama, the Romans never again either waged or were capable of waging a war against a great military power. Their classical wars were those against Samnites, Pyrrhus, and Carthage. Their grand hour was was Cannae, to maintain the heroic posture for centuries on end beyond the power of any people. The Prussian-German people have had three great moments, 1813, 1870, and 1914, and that is more than others have had. Here then I lay down that imperialism of which petrifacts such as the Egyptian Empire, the Roman, the Chinese, the Indian, may continue to exist for hundreds of th- or thousands of years. Dead bodies, amorphous and dispirited masses of men, scrap material from a great history, is to be taken as the typical symbol of the passing away. Imperialism is civilization unadulterated. In this phenomenal form, in this phenomenal form, the duty, in this phenomenal form, the destiny of the West is now irrevocably set. The energy of culture man is directed inwards, that of civilization man outwards. And thus I see in Cecil Rhodes the first man of a new age. He stands for the political state of a far-ranging Western Teutonic and especially German future. 
and his phrase, expansion is everything, is the Napoleonic reassertion of the indwelling tendency of every civilization that has ever fully ripened, Roman, Arab, or Chinese. It is not a matter of choice. It is not the conscious will of individuals, or even that of whole classes or peoples that decides. The expanse of tendency is a doom, something demonic and immense, which grips, forces into service, and uses up the late man kind of the world city stage, willy-nilly, aware or unaware. Life is the process of affecting possibilities, and for the brain man there are only extensive possibilities. Hard as the half-developed socialism of today is fighting against expansion, one day it will become arch-expansionist with all the vehemence of destiny. Here, the form language of politics, as the direct intellectual expression of certain types of humanity, touches on a deep metaphysical problem, on the fact affirmed in the grant of unconditional validity to the causality principle, that the soul is the complement of its extension. When between 480 and 230 BC, the Chinese group of states were tending towards imperialism, it was entirely futile to combat the principle of imperialism. Lin Hang, practiced in particular by the Roman state of Sin, and theoretic, theoretically represented by the philosopher Shang Yi by ideas of the League of Nations, Ho Sun, largely derived from Wan Hu, a profound skeptic, who had no illusions as to the men of the political possibilities of this late period. Both sides opposed the anti-political idealism of Lao Tse, but as between themselves, it was Lin Hang and not Ho Sung which swam with the with the natural current of expansive civilization. Rhodes is to be regarded as the first precursor of a Western type of Caesars, whose day is to come through yet though yet distant. He stands midway between Napoleon and the forced men of the next centuries, just as Flaminius, who from two thirty two BC onward pressed the Romans to undertake the subjugation of Cisalpine Gaul and so initiated the policy of colonial expansion. It stands between Alexander and Caesar. Strictly speaking, Flaminius was a private person, for his real power was a kind not embodied in any constitutional office, who exercised the dominant influence in the state at the time when the state idea was giving way to the pressure of economic factors. So far, so far as Rome was concerned, he was the He was the type of opposition Caesarism. With him, there came to be an end to the idea of state service that became and began the will to power, which ignored the traditions and reckoned only with forces. Alexander and Napoleon were romantics. Though they stood on the threshold of civilization and in its cold, clear air, the one fancied himself an Achilles and the other Werther. Caesar, on the contrary, was a man of pure man of fact, was a pure man of fact, gifted with immense understanding. But even for Rhodes, political successes means territorial and financial success, and only that. Of this Romanness with, within himself, he was fully aware. The Western civilization has not yet taken shape in such strength and purity as this. It is only before his maps that he could fall into a sort of poetic trance, the son of the parsonage who sent out to South Africa without means made a gigantic fortune and employed it in the engine of political aims. His idea of a trans-African railway from the Cape to Cairo, his project of a South African empire, his intellectual hold on the hard metal souls of the mining magnates, whose wealth he forced into the service of his schemes, his capital Bulawayo, royally planned as the future residence of a statesman who was all-powerful, yet stood in no different relation to the state, his wars, his diplomatic ideals, his road systems, his syndicates, his armies, his conception of the great duty to civilization, of the man of brain, all this broad and imposing, is the preclude, the prelude of a future which is still in store for us and with, with which history of Western European mankind will be definitely closed. He who does not understand this that this outcome is obligatory and susceptible of modification. 
that our choice is between willing this and willing nothing at all, between cleaving to this destiny or despairing to the future of life itself. He who cannot feel that there is a grandeur also in the realizations the realizations of power, powerful intelligences and the energy and discipline of metal-hard natures. In battles fought with the coldest and most abstract means, he who is obsessed with the idealism of a provincial of a provincial and would pursue the ways of life past the ways of life of past ages must forego all desire to comprehend history to live through history or to make history thus regarded the imperium Rom romanum appears no longer as an isolated phenomenon but as the normal product of a strict and energetic megalopolitan predominantly practical spirituality as typical of a final and irreversible condition which has occurred often enough, though it may only be identified as such in this instance. Let it be realized, then, that the secret of historical form does not lie on the surface, that it cannot be grasped by means of similarities, costume, and setting, and that in the, descript in the deceptive similarity and in the history of man, as in that of animals and plants, there occur phenomena showing deceptive similarity, but inwardly without connection. E.g. Charlemagne and Harun al-Rashid, Alexander and Caesar, the German wars upon Rome, and the Mongol onslaughts upon West Europe. Another phenomena of extreme outward dissimilarity, but of identical import. E.g. Trajan and Ramses II, the Bourbons and the Attic Demos, Mohammed and Pythagoras. That the 19th and 20th centuries hitherto looked on as the highest point of an ascending straight line of world history are in reality a stage of life which may be observed in every culture that has ripened to its limit, a stage of life characters, characterized not by socialists, impressionists, electric railways, torpedoes, and differential equations, for those are only body constituents of the... of the... Uh, of time but by a civilized spirituality which possesses not only these, but also quite other creative possibilities. That as our own time represents a, transi a transitional phase, which occurs with certainty under particular conditions, there are perfectly well-defined states, such as have occurred more than once in history of the past, later than the present day of Western Europe, and therefore, and therefore that. The future of the West is not, limited, not, is not limitless, tending upwards and onwards for all time towards our present ideals, but a single phenomenon of history, strictly limited and defined as to form and duration, which covers a few centuries and can be viewed in, viewed and in, and in essentials calculated from available precedents. That's the end of...